Welcome as we continue our journey through the book of Esther. And today we are going to be looking at Esther chapter 3, which is where the character of Haman enters the story. So let's start off with Esther chapter 3, verse 1. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, okay, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and set him his seat above all the princes who were with him. This is because uh, in the previous chapter, two of the king's eunuchs had plotted to kill him, to, to murder and assassinate him. And uh, Mordecai found out about it, tells Esther, uh, Esther tells the, the king it's investigated, finds out that he couldn't trust two of his closest people. So now he's doing a little bit of a cabinet reshuffle and he brings in Haman. Haman was an ungodly man, but God had a purpose in allowing an ungodly man to be promoted. And that's something we have to always remember. God has eternal purposes. He doesn't think in current times. He thinks in the eternal purposes, the landscape of eternity. And Haman was a descendant of Agag, who was the king of the Amalekites. They were Israel's sworn enemies for generations. You can read about them in Exodus chapter 17. Now, then we read on to verse 2. And all the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman, for so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai would not bow and pay homage. Then the king's servants who were within the king's gate said to Mordecai, why do you transgress the king's command? Now, there wasn't a biblical command uh, against bowing or paying homage to a political leader as a sign of respect. Uh, you can read about that in Genesis chapter 18, chapter 23, chapter 43, Exodus 18, 2 Samuel chapter 16. But Mordecai knew something about Haman that persuaded him that Haman was unworthy of any honor whatsoever. And it could have been simply because he was an Amalekite. Could have just been that. It was his ancestry. So he gets asked, why don't you follow the king's command? We, we, there's no evidence anywhere of a specific command from King Ahasuerus that all had to bow before Haman. Uh, perhaps it was implied because of the promotion that he received. We don't know. Esther chapter 3, verse 4. Now it happened when they spoke to him daily, and he would not listen to them, that they told it to Haman. So this is all the people going up to Mordecai. But, you know, in, in modern parlance, dude, why don't you just bow? I don't understand why you won't bow. They, wouldn't, uh, they couldn't get through to him. So they told it to Haman to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. For Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with wrath, but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. So Mordecai and his resistance to bow had not been noticed by Haman. And once it was pointed out to him by some of his aides, he got really frustrated by it. Why? Biggest problem Haman had, insecurity and pride. He basically put himself in a position mentally where he could only consider himself a success if everybody else thought he was a success. And he decided not to take his anger out against Mordecai. No, he was going to take his anger against the whole Jewish people that were part of the kingdom. Now remember, this is an enormous kingdom. This is a kingdom that stretches from India all the way to Libya. Okay, this is enormous. Jewish people everywhere. And he exposed his hatred for the Jewish people. Haman did in this situation. So now we talk about some time frames, and the time frames are very important in this story. Wherever there's time frames mentioned in the Bible, they are always important. Don't just over, overlook them. In the first month, this is verse 7, which is the month of Nisan, in the 12th year of King Ahasuerus, they cast per, P-U-R, that is, the lot, before Haman, to determine the day and the month until it fell on the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. Okay. Now, this is interesting. The Persian word for the word lot, or per, P-U-R, uh, the Persian word for that is something like dice, like rolling the dice. Just roll the dice until you get the answer you want. 
or, or unless you want to just leave the decision totally up to chance, to, to chance, just roll the dice. Um, so what happened? Until it fell in the 12th month. So this all took place, the events of Mordecai not bowing to Haman took place in the first month of the year. And the casting of the lot, the rolling of the dice, determined that the Jews would not be attacked or massacred until the end of the year. So another 11 months later, very, very important fact in the story, which proves the truth of Proverbs chapter 16, verse 33. The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. You might be, they might have been rolling the dice, think it was all chance, but it was chance determined by God. And the long delay between the first month and the last month uh, for the massacre of the Jewish people to actually take place was ordained by God so that he could fulfill his purposes. God is always in the details, especially when we can't see it. You have to remember that. So here we go. Haman, now he's got this plot and he just can't help himself. He's got to do something with it. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, there is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom and their laws are different from all other people's. And they do not keep the king's laws. Therefore, it is not fitting for the king to let them remain. If it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work and bring it into the king's treasures. Haman's charge was the most horrible kind of charge. It was a half truth. It had not the full truth in it. The Jews were a certain people and they were scattered and they were dispersed. And yes, they did have their own laws. But their own laws that they were living by didn't prevent them from actually keeping the king's laws as loyal subjects. Uh, Mordecai's refusal to bow before Haman was not based on the law of God at all, but on the principle of his own personal integrity. Uh, Haman was completely unfamiliar with the principle of having integrity in your own personhood that therefore should be respected by other people. It, it, it was like it never even entered his head. That, that will show you the level of pride that he had. So Haman suggests, let's write a decree and we'll send it out throughout all the, all the empire. So let's basically, what he was saying is let's organize the mass murder of the Jewish people. Let's take them out as a race within the, within the empire. Uh, Haman never told Ahasuerus that he was talking about the Jews, ever. And he never said how many people there were in the kingdom. He probably thought there was some little threat. He, he wasn't paying any attention, Ahasuerus. And Haman says, I will pay 10,000 talents of silver. It was the, the promise of a bribe is what it was. And the money wasn't going to come out of Haman's pocket. It was going to be obtained from the slaughter of the Jews. No different to what Adolf Hitler did in World War II. Part, part, of, part of everything that he did that was horrific to the Jewish people was to take their possessions, their art, their gold, uh, all their rings. I mean, billions and billions of dollars of, of spoils taken by, the, uh, by Hitler in the Second World War. No different than what Haman was plotting two and a half thousand years before. So then we move on to verse 10. So the king took his signet ring from his hand, gave it to Haman, the son of Hamath, 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 Hamadatha. You just need to slow down. Whenever you've got those words in the Bible, you've got to slow down, enunciate. The son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, the money and the people are given to you to do with them as seems good to you. King Ahasuerus had no clue what he was giving Haman permission to do. He thought that it was just going to be the execution of a few people of dangerous, who were dangerous revolutionaries in his kingdom. So the decree gets published, verse 12. Then the king's scribes were called on the 13th day of the first month, and the decree was written according to all that Haman commanded. To the king's satraps, to the governors who were over each province, to the officials of all people, to every province according to its script, and to every people in their language. In the name of King Ahasuerus, it was written and sealed with the king's signet ring. And the letters were sent by couriers into all the king's provinces to destroy, 
to kill and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their possessions. Now, this is important because, again, this is another part of the detail that you are going to see contrasted later on in the story. Haman wanted to kill all the Jews and take their goods. That is not how the reverse carried out later on in the story. Okay, let's continue on in, uh, in Esther chapter 3. A copy of the document was to be issued as law in every province, being published for all people, that they should be ready for that day. The couriers went out, hastened by the king's command, and the decree was proclaimed in Shushan the citadel. So the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Shushan was perplexed. There was an empire-wide death sentence put on the Jewish people, and it was announced by the king, which was just like all the other attacks on Jewish people in history, except this one was actually announced 11 months before it was going to happen. Can you imagine? Hey, just letting you know that if you're Jewish on this 13th day of the 12th month, like in 11 months, we're all coming after you, and you're all going to get killed. Just letting you know. So the king sits down to drink. Now, he doesn't realize what he's done. Doesn't realize. Okay? He didn't understand. Uh, Haman sits down to drink with him because he thinks he's, like, nailed it. He knew exactly what he was trying to do. But the city was perplexed. Now, why? I'll tell you why the city was perplexed. Because they're all scratching their head going, look, every Jew I know is amazing. They're great people. They don't cause any problems to anybody. They're good citizens. Um... So we don't understand why the king would want to do this. Uh, and particularly, why would he call them dangerous enemies? They're not enemies at all. All this is unfolding because of the insecurity and the wounded pride of wicked Haman because Mordecai wouldn't bow to him. Simple as that. Which leads me to my observation for today as we wrap up this chapter. Haman had all this power and position. He could have anything, do anything, but he was insecure because one man wouldn't bow to him. And so he wanted to wipe out an entire people because of that. That's how insecure he was. And there's still people like that today. Didn't play out well for Haman, as we're going to find out, and it won't play out well for people today. And that's the confidence we have from the Word of God. What are your observations so far about this journey through Esther? I, I hope you're intrigued. I love it. It's, it's, isn't it? It's like a journey of intrigue where you just can't wait for the next chapter. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful story that gives us insight into how you play a role in every single part of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.